At the other end of the technical spectrum to the poppy-headed cup are two simple round bottom pinch pots with tapered rims, also known as Form R cups. The extraordinary feature of these cups is their small size, measuring just 3cm high with mouth diameters of 2.5cm, making them the smallest pots in the assemblage. Pottery is a really valuable resource for archaeologists because it's very robust and survives well in the archaeological record and its most immediate use is that it allows us to quickly date a lot of different contexts. Archaeologists have developed typologies which are categorising different types of vessel from all different archaeological periods from prehistory through to the present. And by looking at those different types of vessel and knowing where they come from from decades of different types of analysis and comparing those with secure contexts that have been radiocarbon dated, we can often look at different pot types and very, very quickly find out how old a feature is, which period it comes from, and which fashion that pot belongs to. So whether it is grooved ware, for example, um, devil rimbry, post-devil rimbry, all these different pot types allow us to, to really successfully and quickly date contexts. Given the scale of the task to refit the pots from the site and the quantity of vessels that were found from the Musfarn settlement, it's incredibly fortunate that the archaeologists involved were able to have found these tiny pinch pots still intact. On most archaeological projects, only a sample of the archaeology is dug, so percentages, and that's something that's a fairly common process for all UK archaeological projects. But at Must Farm, we were lucky enough to be able to have a very self-contained site, and we were also able to excavate 100% of that. And not all of the pottery was preserved owing to a variety of different reasons, but that meant we were left with a very contained group of different sherds that we could analyse. So there were 2,416 different sherds that were found, and we were able to do a process that we call refitting. And that's where we lay out all of those sherds and create the most complicated 3D jigsaw that you can imagine. A variety of different experts and specialists in pottery were able to go through all of those different components, try fitting those shares back together, and through them they were able to create uh, a detailed compilation of all of the different vessel types. So by refitting all of those 2,000 plus shares, we were able to come up with 128 different vessels, and only just over 200 of those couldn't be assigned to an individual vessel. So it meant that we were able to get an extraordinary amount of information on the complete range of vessels that were present at that site. Although included in the cup category, it seems unlikely that these vessels functioned in the same way as the other cups in the assemblage. So why were these pots made, and what were they being used for? Within this assemblage, there are quite a few little teeny tiny pots. And that's, that's interesting. I mean, we look at those and you sort of wonder what on earth could you possibly need a little tiny pot for? Um, well... The first thought is maybe this is people learning to make pots. Maybe this is children learning to make pots. And certainly it's something which is often absent from archaeological records is, is the existence of children. And we know they must have been there. We, you know, we've got adults, so they must have had children. Um, so these pots could be people learning to make pots and it would be a perfect way of doing it. You sit there next to mum who's making a beautiful bowl and you learn how to make your pot and at the end of it it goes by the fire and it gets fired in the fire and you've got a finished pot. But I think there's another aspect to little pots and it, it sort of talks about the fact that there are processes often going on within um, prehistoric settlements on settlements of all different time periods that we don't really know about we tend to think of the sort of bigger things we think of the making of pots we think of the casting of bronze we think of the working of wood and we often don't think about the little odds and ends that were going on maybe maybe the little pot uh, of um, uh, of some sort of uh, unguent that uh, that people were using for their skin or maybe makeup or possibly just little pots for having a bit of water in while you're working the pots and I was talking the other day to two ladies who do textile work and they were asking me if I could make them some little replica pots that they could use to have as a pot of water next to them when they're working so they can dip the threads into that so they can wet their fingers while they're working and these are all things that you would need little pots for. So I think the idea that we're getting a range of different sizes just really reflects a range of different uses for these pots. 
and maybe a little bit of the training process. Aside from the use of the pots, the range in vessel sizes from Must Farm raises a few questions when it comes to how they were fired. As regards firing pots, um, small pots, domestic size sorts of pots, can be fired in a domestic fire. And I think even in a structure which is on a wattle platform over water, they had hearths. They had hearths which were fireproof enough for them to be able to cook, cook in. Um, and you could fire small pots within that fire. A lot of the pots are tempered with uh, flint, and we know that, generally speaking, flint can't be fired too much over 800 degrees centigrade, otherwise it does cause problems. So we know that they're aiming for temperatures under 800, and that's the sort of temperature you can get in a domestic fire. But when you get up to bigger pots, when you get up to much larger pots, that's not going to be feasible to fire within the hot without burning it down. And I, we know that Most Farm was burned down, but I doubt that that was because they were foolish enough to try and fire a large pot in there. So they must have been moving these to, if they were making them within the settlement, they must have been moving them to a dry land site in order to fire them. And even then, large pots fired in completely open fires are very difficult to manage. And the pots that we see at Must Farm do appear to be quite evenly fired. So my personal feeling is that we may be looking at pots that were being fired in a, some kind of hearth, controlled, air-controlled hearth, or maybe a sort of prototype kiln. These are things which have not yet been found. We've not been found in Britain, but we know that large pots were being made, large pots were being fired, and successfully fired very evenly. So I think there is still a lot of research to be done to look at the ways in which they could have been firing these and to look for possible sites where they may have fired them. Even though we have these extraordinary preservation conditions at Must Farm, we're still faced with some questions that we just simply can't answer. So despite having textiles, food remains, all of these fantastic opportunities to look further into the past and explore elements of Bronze Age life that we never would normally expect to, there are still aspects such as where the pots were fired, whether that was close by, whether it was further afield and they were traded, that we just simply haven't got an answer to at the moment. And it's likely that, that probably won't ever change unless through further landscape explorations of the Flagfin Basin we happen to stumble across um, some, some remains of kilns or, or other evidence of the firing process.